today it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cynthia Wolberger. Um, Cynthia obtained her PhD at Harvard with Steve Harrison and ended postdocs at UCSF and at Johns Hopkins before she accepted uh, a faculty position at Johns Hopkins, where she's now a professor of biophysics and biophysical chemistry at the School of Medicine. So she's done some groundbreaking work in our studies of sirtuins, ubiquitin chains, and the role of histone ubiquitination in transcription and in chromatin dynamics. Um, and her important work has been recognized in many ways, and I'm not going to mention everything, but just at price she won like the Dorothy Krauthfoot Hodgkin Award from the Protein Society. And as of last year, she's a member of both the American Academy of Science, um, American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences. Um, so I think that's where I'll stop. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Cynthia, for sharing your work with us today. And I'm looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you all very much for, for organizing this. Um, this is ex exciting for me. I've never done a talk like this online. I think it's a, it's a terrific new venue that makes it possible for many more people to participate. So, uh, oh, already I have trouble advancing the slides. There we go. So I'm going to be talking with you about our work on uh, the mechanism of crosstalk between histone ubiquitination and methylation. And uh, just to start, I know this is a, a chromatin meeting, but there are always new people. And so really I wanted to start <clears throat> just uh, reminding everyone of the, the very basics. And that is that uh, the four core histone proteins, uh, of which there are two copies each of the nucleosome, are subject to an absolutely enormous array of post-translational modifications. And this is an old schematic that just highlights a few of them, but uh, many of us and many of you who are listening are, are very active in studying the role of very particular types of modifications at particular residues in particular histones and uh, how those modifications regulate uh, transcription in a variety of ways. So these modifications vary really enormously, both in their chemistry and their size. And so there are the small chemical modifications such as acetylation, phosphorylation, succinylation. And here's an example of one of them, just uh, we have a lysine side chain over here, and here is a methyl lysine. So the, uh, this little methyl group here, conjugated to the lysine, all the way up to really enormous modifications such as ubiquitin, and that's gonna be the one I'm gonna be focusing on in part today. So this is the conjugation of an entire 76 amino acid protein via its C-terminus to the lysine epsilon amino group. Now, everyone's familiar with the role of ubiquitin in targeting uh, proteins for, for proteasomal degradation, but I'm going to be talking about ubiquitin as a signal, as another kind of post-translational histone modification that regulates a variety of processes. And depending on where the ubiquitin is attached, that then influences or that then determines what the actual effect is on transcription. So for example, monoubiquitination of histone H2A at lysine 119 is a hallmark of heterochromatin, while monoubiquitination of histone H2B, and that's, this, is, this position is lysine 120 in humans and 123 in yeast, is a hallmark of actively transcribed genes. And that, this is the one that I'm going to be talking about today. So, the role of ubiquitin that I'll be talking about is the way in which it is responsible for essentially a cascade of modifications in which first monoubiquitination of H2B then stimulates deposition of two methyl marks that are important for active transcription. So if you look across a, a transcribed gene, there is a distribution of monoubiquitinated H2B that it peaks at the start site of transcription, but is uh, distributed broadly across the gene. And this modification is required for deposition of uh, methylation of histone H3, lysine 4, so in particular di and trimethylation. So this is a methyl mark on the tail of the histone that peaks actually around the plus one nucleosome and is, is mo most concentrated here. And ubiquitination is also required for, uh, whoops, 
methylation of histone H3 lysine 79, so particularly di and trimethylation, which is a modification in the core of the histone that's more broadly distributed across the entire gene body. Now, these, both of these methyl marks serve somewhat similar and also somewhat different roles. So they're both dependent on monoubiquitination of H2B, and they're both involved in activating transcription. Um, they play somewhat different biological roles. So H3K4 methylation, for example, is important in cell differentiation. In yeast, H3K79 methylation plays a specific role in telomeric silencing, which is uh, specific to fungi. Uh, it also plays a role in DNA damage response, whereas H3K4 is important in enhancer function. And finally, misregulation of both of these methyl marks is implicated in a variety of cancers. So although both of these marks are dependent on the attachment of monoubiquitin in the same location, there, the methylation that's stimulated by this ubiquitin is in a rather different environment. So H3K79 methylation is located here in the globular core of the nucleosome, whereas H3K4 methylation is here in the flexible tail of histone H3. Um, H3K79 is relatively close to the ubiquitin mark, about 25 angstroms away, whereas uh, the H3K4 site is quite a bit farther from ubiquitin. Now, this is a crystal structure. I don't mean to imply this is a rigid tail. It's flexible, but it's still farther away from the ubiquitin mark than H3K79. Another difference is the accessibility of the site that's methylated. So H3K79, is, as I said, located in the globular core, and it's actually a buried side chain. I'll show you a video of this in a minute, but this side chain, I think this arrow, yeah. Um, this side chain over here is pretty buried on the surface of the nucleosome, whereas H3K4 is very flexible and exposed. So these two methylation, marks that are stimulated by H2B ubiquitination are deposited by two very different methyl transferases. So H3K79 here in the core is methylated by the, the original, originally discovered methyl transferase in yeast is dot one, and in humans it's called dot one L, dot one like. And this is a structure of the human dot one, and we have structures of both yeast <clears throat> and human. H3K4 is <clears throat> methylated by a much larger enzyme complex. So it's this multi-subunit complex called COMPASS in yeast or MLL1 in, in humans. And I'll be talking about the yeast. There's this catalytic subunit set one here, but it's really all of these subunits together that are required for both the activity of set one, as well as its ability to be stimulated by monoubiquitin. Now, when we started working on this crosstalk between ubiquitination and methylation, there really were quite a few open questions. First of all, neither of these complexes contains any of the known ubiquitin binding structural motifs, and their experiments attempting to even determine where the ubiquitin bound didn't come up with anything. They, both of the catalytic domains, so set one and then dot one L, belong to completely different families of methyl transferases. And notably, something I'd like to point out uh, at the outset is that while the mechanism wasn't clear in either case, we certainly knew that monoubiquitination didn't simply act to recruit the complex. In other words, if you looked at the affinity of a nucleosome with and without ubiquitin, both of these methyl transferases bind with comparable affinity. So it's not just raising uh, the affinity. So, what I'll talk to you is about the work that we've done in our structural studies in determining what the molecular basis is of the crosstalk between histone ubiquitination and methylation. So how are these complexes recruited by uh, H2B monoubiquitination and what can we learn from these structures about the mechanism by which this monoubiquitin mark stimulates these two very different methyl transferases. And I'll start by telling you about the work that we've done on dot one L. So this is the human enzyme that methylates H3K79, mono, di, and trimethylation. 
So these, these are uh, figures taken from a 2008 paper here by Steger et al, which is simply to make the point that methylation of H3K79 is highly correlated with levels of transcription. And so the, the light gray lines uh, show uh, uh, genes uh, on the distribution relative to the transcription start site of methylation in uh, uh, genes that are with not a lot of activity, more highly transcribed genes and most highly transcribed genes. So, so you could see the correlation between levels of transcription and the methylation of H3K79 by DOT1L. So DOT1L is quite a large protein, it's about 1500 amino acids, but the business end is here at the amino terminus. So it's got about a 350 amino acid catalytic domain. And this is the structure shown over here, one of the structures of DOT1L, so the human enzyme. There are also are structures of the yeast enzyme, but again, I'm focusing on the human. So as I told you before, there's nothing in this structure that we could see that looks like anything that we know of that binds ubiquitous. Now, in addition to this catalytic domain over here, there's a long region here that's really not well characterized structurally, but what we do know is that this is a portion of DOT1L that interacts with a variety of other proteins with which DOT1L forms a larger complex that's recruited to chromatin and methylates H3K79. DOT1L has been quite of interest in drug discovery because of its role in MLL rearranged leukemia. So, this is depicted here in one of the MLL complexes that uh, is the human counterpart of COMPASS, which methylates H3K4. And there are chromosomal translocations that replace this catalytic domain of MLL with one of the partners of DOT1L. And these partners drag DOT1L into this complex, and this is now recruited and hypermethylates H3K79 instead of h 3 K4, and something on the order of 40% of these MLL rearranged leukemias involve fusions with DOT1L partners that incorporate DOT1L into this hybrid complex. So the, the connection between H2B ubiquitination and methylation was first discovered in yeast. And this shows a panel from one of these papers that shows, so this is a Western blot with antibodies against uh, H, methylated H3K79, and so here's the wild type. And these, these, at the absence here of methyl marks shows you that if you either mutate that uh, residue that can be ubiquitinated to one that cannot be, or if you knock out one of the enzymes in the machinery, so this is the E2 enzyme that attaches ubiquitin to H2B, you also knock out H3K79 methylation. And this was subsequently shown to be true in human cells as well. Now, it's really just the ubiquitin that stimulates it. And this is a panel from this paper by Rob McGinty uh, and Tom Muir showing that if you simply take recombinant nucleosomes and attach ubiquitin, you can stimulate the activity of DOT1L. So H3K79 methylation, this is what Western bot also with the same antibody. So it's just the ubiquitin that's stimulating it. So interestingly, I think I, I mentioned already that it really doesn't have an effect on recruitment. And you, we've been able to do Michaela Smetton kinetics. And I said, this was initially work also done by Rob McGinty, showing that when you look at the activity of DOT1L, on a nucleosome that is unmodified, shown here, or one that is modified as a function of uh, nucleosome concentration, there's really no effect at all on the KM, which is typically reflective of binding. It's really a catalytic effect, so an increase in catalytic rate. Now, another mystery has been how DOT1L could even get at its side chain. So we've had structures of, of DOT1L, starting with the yeast and the human enzyme, for 17 years. Yet with all of the different structures we have of DOT1L, and now the many structures we have of nucleosomes, it's never been possible to even build a model for how DOT1L even gets at this side chain over here. And that's because this side chain is very buried. So you can take this structure and try as hard as you can to dock this, including changing the rotomers on the side chain, and they don't fit together. So there's something that has to change here in order for DOT1L to act on a nucleosome. And so this is a, a 
video that I make. And now this one doesn't quite work. So I'm going to have to, I will manually play this for you, but the rest of my movies work. Uh oh. All right, let's try. Okay. So if we zoom in a little bit here, so there's this side chain, which I can pointing, I'm pointing to over here, which you really can see from the space filling model is really quite buried on the surface of the nucleosome. So I'm just making the point here, really how inaccessible this is. So in order to figure out how DOT1L is stimulated by ubiquitin, binds ubiquitin, and how it gets at that side chain, a uh, postdoc in the lab, Evan Warden, determined the cryo-EM structure of DOT1L bound to a nucleosome with H2B chemically linked to lysine 120. And this was a structure determined at 3.9 angstroms resolution. And this shows you a map here that's colored according to the local resolution. So here's a little tour. So this, this movie now should work. So here we see the nucleosome here. Here's ubiquitin shown in purple and dot one L shown in green. And it's, it's positioned inside a semi-transparent uh, density map uh, from cryo-EM. So, now this should play. Yeah, so we're turning around here. So we're turning and looking at the other side of the structure. And we're going to zoom in now on the interaction, the location of the interaction between DOT1L and ubiquitin. So it turned out DOT1L had a ubiquitin binding region. It was a, just a novel ubiquitin binding region. There's no conformational changes at all in this region of the protein. This is actually a very rigid portion. I, I don't know if you can all see me. Normally when I give a seminar, I hold my hand and I show how it, the uh, dot one L sort of grasping the base here of ubiquitin and interacting with this hydrophobic patch down here centered around uh, leucine 73 and 71 and isoleucine 36. So this is actually not the typical portion of ubiquitin that's contacted. So most proteins actually that recognize ubiquitin bind to a hydrophobic patch centered over here around isoleucine 44, whereas DOT1L is interacting with this atypical patch. And this is actually uh, perfectly consistent with a paper published five years ago from Tom Muir's lab, in which they actually introduced mutations uh, all over ubiquitin and found that it was in fact this little patch over here containing leucine 71 and 73 that was responsible for activating DOT1L. So when they substituted them with alanines, you no longer had activation of DOT1L methyltransferase activity. So perfect agreement with the structure and also uh, thank you, Tom, because we didn't have to do that experiment ourselves. So very exciting. We now know how ubiquitin binds to DOT1L, but the structure clearly didn't tell us what everything that we wanted to know, because we saw very quickly that, so if you look at the catalytic domain here, and this is the location of S-adenosylmethionine. So it's docked in the active site, and SAM as we call it, this is the methyl donor, and this is the methyl group on SAM that needs to be conjugated to the lysine, is 21 angstroms apart. So while this complex uh, clearly told us how it bound ubiquitin, and I, I've omitted all the other mutagenesis experiments that confirm this, it clearly wasn't showing us how it methylated it because this is way too far away. You know, enzymes can't pluck off methyl groups and throw them down onto the surface of the nucleosome. So we thought again, and Evan came up with a very clever idea that, that that allowed us to determine the structure of the active complex. So he had noted that in the literature, it had been reported in a couple of papers for the set family of methyltransferases. So this is not dot one, it's the actually the family that belongs to the compass complex that I'm gonna talk about later in this seminar. They found with set methyltransferases that if you take a lysine side chain and you replace it with norleucine, so this is a non-natural amino acid, it's like a lysine side chain missing this charged NH3 plus group. They found that replacing lysine with norleucine and then looking at binding of those peptides to set methyltransferases greatly increased the affinity up to a thousand fold. So Evan decided to replace lysine 79 in 
histone H3 with norleucine. And that, in fact, did the trick, as I'll show you here. So first, the structure. So this is now a structure determined by also Nick Hoffman, postdoc in the lab, uh, working with Evan Warden. And this is a high-resolution structure of the active complex. And this is just my one little uh, uh, structurally density nerdy slide to show you a cross-section of the map and to show you really how well-defined everything is. So this is really uh, a beautiful map. So for the non-structural biologists, what we get from our experiments are these maps and we build models to fit to the maps. And so uh, this is just a very beautiful map here. Okay, so what do we learn from it? So now I'll give you a tour of the active state of dot one l I'll compare it with the other, the previous state, which we now call the poised state. So this is the structure of the active state with the map. And if we morph between this and the first structure that I show you, what you'll see immediately is that dot one l is moving. So that first structure in the poised state added up there, and now this active state, the dot one l is much closer to the nucleosome, and it's all pivoting around this ubiquitin here. So it's grasping the ubiquitin in the same way and moving between these two states. So now we're turning around and looking at the other side, and I wanna point out one more thing, and that is the red over here. So this is the tail of histone H4. And what you'll see is that in this active state with dot one l now moved closer to the nucleosome, the tail of histone H4 becomes structured. So this is a portion of histone H4 that's pretty floppy and it adopts, it's either disordered in different structures of the nucleosome or it flops around. So here's now the histone H4, here's lysine 79, there's S adenosyl methionine, the methyl donor. And now at the other end here, here are the two elements about which the structure is pivoting. One is the ubiquitin over here, which I showed you already in the poised state, and the other is a contact with the acidic patch. So actually in both of the structures, there's a very clearly resolved arginine side chain over here, arginine 282, that's interacting with the acidic patch of histone H2A. So for those of you who are just still a little new to the uh, chromatin field or haven't thought too much about this part, there's a conserved acidic patch that's in the H2A, H2B dimer, so a whole series of acidic residues, and quite a quite a few different proteins that interact with nucleosomes target that acidic patch. So in this case, it's this arginine residue here, and it's actually also locked in the same position. So it's not only the ubiquitin that's serving as the pivot point, but also this arginine residue over here. And indeed, when we mutate that residue, so we do a charge inversion, and we replace this arginine with a glutamic acid, we completely obliterate activity. And importantly, as you see here, it's not just the difference between the presence of ubiquitin uh, and the absence of ubiquitin, but both the unstimulated, so minus ubiquitin plus ubiquitin activity is completely obliterated. It's basically down in the noise. So that's consistent with our structures, which is whether or not there's ubiquitin there, this constitutes an important interaction with the face of the nucleosome. So as I said, this uh, acidic patch is a, seems to be a hot spot for many proteins that interact with nucleosomes. And this shows you just a few structures where again, there are interactions with the acidic patch. Now, interestingly, a lot of things we look at on the chromatin field, there's some kind of conserved structural motif that interacts with uh, given modifications or elements, but there's no rhyme or reason to this one. There's basically nothing conserved except the presence of arginines. So clusters of arginines, positively charged, interact with this acidic patch, which is shown here in red in each of these structures. This is the electrostatic surface potential. Now, I told you that one of the other mysteries here was how does dot one l get at that H3K79 side chain, which is pretty buried. And we were completely taken by surprise to discover that it's not dot one l that conforms itself to the nucleosome surface, but it's 
primarily the nucleosome that's remodeling. So there's a conformational change that is quite dramatic that's induced by DOT1L that brings this side chain pointing up and now brings it within three angstroms of the methyl group of the SAM cofactor. And you can see that conformational change here on the right. Now I'm gonna animate this now. We're in the poised state here and watch what happens with this H3K79 in this globular portion of histone H3 is it really very dramatically unravels and points that side chain up straight into the active site of DOT1L. So this is, this is another view. So this was really, really shocking because if you look at the globular core of the nucleosome, we think of it as a rock. And if you look at the countless structures now of nucleosomes in the PDB, you know, starting of course with the, carrot, the Luger and Richmond structure, the globular core always looks the same. And you'll see this dramatic unwinding. So this is this end of the helix and it's 10 H3. And what I'm gonna show you is you're gonna watch these hydrogen bonds that stabilize the helix being ripped apart. See, here are those hydrogen bonds. And this is this deformation that allows that side chain to go up. So this is a really energetically costly conformational change. You know, breaking all those hydrogen bonds costs quite a bit. And I'll come back to what's paying for that. But, and here again, you're seeing how that conformational change now brings the side chain up to the methyl donor. So another surprising aspect of the structure was the role of the tail of histone H4. So you could think of this tail as coming up and grabbing DOT1L and stabilizing it on the surface of the nucleosome. And there is this groove in DOT1L that's the, the location in which this tail binds. So there's this deep binding groove just through the tail of histone H4, which we previously did not know about. So here's the tail of histone H4 shown in the density map, and it's mediating two very important contexts. So the, the key region to look at is this arginine, histi oh, sorry, arginine, histidine, arginine. So arginine 17 is inserting into a conserved acidic pocket. So this is the, now the human enzyme we're looking at, but this pocket's also very conserved in the yeast enzyme. And then this other side chain here, arginine 19, which is contacting histone H3. Now in hindsight, we shouldn't have been surprised by looking at this role of the tail of histone H4 contacting DOT1L, because it had in fact already been shown first by Scott Briggs uh, for yeast and then for the human enzyme that in fact, these arginine residues are quite important for DOT1L activity. So shown in this experiment here, so we're looking at mono, di, and trimethylation of H3K79. And as was shown in, in this paper by Fingerman et al, mutations that substitute either arginine 17 or 19 or both give rise to a dramatic decrease in methyltransferase activity. So again, this is supporting the importance of both of these residues for DOT1L activity and confirming the, the structural uh, interactions that we see. So that tail of histone H4 is not just pulling DOT1L down, on, down onto the surface of the nucleosome, it's helping to stabilize or promote this conformational change. So I told you earlier, uh, ripping apart these hydrogen bonds is pretty unfavorable, but what you'll see is that the tail of histone H4 is compensating for that. So once this conformation changed, that arginine residue 19 comes in here and this positive charge interacts with all these negatively charged carbonyls. So that's helping pay for ripping apart these hydrogen bonds and helping to stabilize that conformation there. So in addition to the arginine, there's a whole series of hydrophobic residues that are also forming van der Waals interactions. So we arginine on this side, this phenylalanine, these other residues here, all of which we've shown by mutagenesis are quite important. All of this helps to stabilize this active conformation and stick that lysine up in the active site. And you can see that those residues form a really narrow tunnel. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you a movie where we're gonna look from underneath and actually look at a, a, a surface depiction that shows you the narrow hole in which that lysine side chain is inserting. 
And that helps to answer the question actually of how this enzyme works. So methyltransferases need to deprotonate this lysine. You gotta pull off one of the hydrogens, get, you know, get rid of the positive charge so that this could initiate the attack on the methyl group. This is a adenosylmethionine. So it's always been unclear what deprotonates lysine 79. We could never find an active site residue that pulls off that proton. And the answer from previous work and looking at our structure again is there is no active site residue. And what's actually happening is that dot 1L with the help of the tail of histone H4 is shoving that positively charged side chain into this narrow hydrophobic tunnel and it's placing it in that environment that actually lowers the pKa. In other words, it favors the unprotonated form. And that is how the enzyme catalyzes a methylation of this residue. Okay, so I just want to uh, just summarize very quickly. So how does this work? This part of my seminar, I should say. So we have this ubiquitin and the acidic patch. That's this pivot point. And this is anchoring dot one L and really restricting its movement. So it's, it's restricting its conformational search and helping to increase its activity that way. And then the tail of histone H4 is assisting dot one L in causing this side chain to deform, this part of histone H3, poking the side chain up into the active site. And I think of this as sort of this robin shown over here, which is standing on its feet. And it's looking around for a worm and it occasionally goes down, dips down, and finds the worm and pulls it out of the ground. Okay, and finally, I just wanna point out how exciting it is to us to think about what else might be deforming the histone octamer core. So we tend to think of it as a rock, and this is pointing out that it's not a rock. We already know that histone remodeling enzymes can distort the histone core, but this is just a, a one that deposits post-translational modification. So are there other enzymes that do this? Are there readers that distort H3? Stay tuned, we'll find out. Okay, so the, for the last bit of my talk, I'm gonna go over in a little less detail the recent work that we've done to look at the crosstalk between ubiquitination and methylation of H3K4 by the COMPASS complex. So again, like as in the case of H3K79, uh, H3K4 uh, monodyne trimethylation is uh, correlated with high levels of transcription. It's particularly occurs near just downstream of the transcription start site. And again, knocking out the ubiquitination machinery knocks out methylation. So among other functions of this methylation mark, one of them is stimulating the saga methyltransferase to hyperacetylate histone H3. So saga, uh, the saga hat module subcomplex has uh, uh, domains in it that recognize the H3K4 methyl mark and that stimulates a uh, process of uh, hyperacetylation of histone H3, which again, and so another portion of the cascade in this uh, histone modification signaling event. So unlike dot one L, the catalytic domain, which is set one, is part of a big complex. It's a, actually an eight protein complex it's elucidated by work, part a lot of work from Ali Shalati's lab. And of these eight complexes, the minimal H2B uh, sensing complex has been defined. So six of the eight subunits are sufficient for both stimulating the activity of the catalytic domain, which also has low activity when it's not in the complex, and responding to the presence of monoubiquitinated H2B, so stimulating methylation of H3K4. I'm gonna be talking about the yeast complex, but I wanna point out that this is conserved through humans, and of these subunits, these five here have their counterparts in human MLL. So there are structures of the yeast compass complex. This is a cryo-EM structure uh, from Yorgo Skiniotis's lab that was published just about a year and a half ago. And there's also a structure of the K-lactis corresponding complex from Ning Zhang's lab. <clears throat> so we had, as in dot one L, we had structures of the complex in the absence of a ubiquitinated nucleosome. So Evan, again, decided to use his trick with replacing lysine with norleucine 
So he did the same now for histone at H3K4, uh, chemically ubiquitin of the nucleosomes, uh, and determined the structure of that complex by cryo-EM at 3.37 angstrom's resolution. And this was just very recently published. So the COMPASS complex. So here's our tour now of COMPASS. So starting here with the uh, cryo-EM map, and we'll dissolve it away, and now look at all of these six subunits bound to the ubiquitinated nucleosome. So here we're rotating around, there's the ubiquitin over there. And from this view, there, so this is set one in green. This is the catalytic domain. These are these other subunits. Uh, CP, I'm not gonna keep reciting their names. I know it sounds like alphabet soup, but CP is 30, 40, 60, and 25. And here is the tail of histone H3. So that's shown as the space filling model over here and S adenosyl methionine, the methyl donor. So now we'll, we'll rotate around and look at the other side. And now we'll look at the back side of the complex and see these domains here. So first I wanna point out, so this complex straddles the nucleosome. So very different from DOT1L. It's completely spanning across the face of the nucleosome and unlike DOT1L, contacting the DNA. So there are DNA contacts between CPS60 over here. This, uh, this WD40 domain, CPS50 is contacting here. And CPS40, I'm, I'm drawing this here because we don't see density, but there's this very basic loop here full of lysines and arginines that are conserved that are also in the vicinity of the DNA. So this is straddling the surface of the nucleosome again, contacting the face of the nucleosome, as well as making contacts to the DNA. So one of the first things we looked at was which tail of histone H3 is actually being methylated. So here, now I've stripped away everything in the complex. So we're looking at the ubiquitin and just the catalytic domain set one and shown here in blue over here is the tail of histone H3. So we see the first eight amino acids in the tail of histone H3, but the rest of it is disordered until we get to the globular domain, not until we get to like the residue 38 in each of the copies of histone H3. But then here's the question, which copy of histone H3 is this being stimulated to methylate? So if you look at the distance between that one and this copy of H3 over here, so this is cis H3, or the copy of H3 that's exposed on the surface of the nucleosome, it's quite far apart. It's actually 88 angstroms apart, whereas this one is only 35 angstroms away. And so the ubiquitin on one surface of the nucleosome is actually stimulating methylation of the tail of the copy of H3 that's located on the opposite face. So sort of a trans signaling between ubiquitination on one face and methylation of the copy of H3 located at the other face. So in the case of DOT1L, we saw that there was really no conformational change at all. There, there, there are modest conformational changes in the enzyme, but it's pretty similar both in the APO and the nucleosome bound form. Whereas COMPASS undergoes really a tremendous flexing in order to accommodate itself to the nucleosome. So what I've done here is shown the COMPASS APO complex. Uh, this is the yeast complex uh, from the uh, Shalotifard skinniotis structure. And I've just superimposed here this nucleosome and here's the ubiquitin. So this is from our final structure. And I'm going to morph between the APO structure and the final structure so that you can really see how these domains have bent down onto the nucleosome and made their complex here. So while this is capable of spanning the nucleosome, this conformational change is what's critical to allow all of these domains to touch the nucleosome. And perhaps the most important of these new contacts is mediated by this helix shown over here. So this is the RXR helix. It was, it's part of the uh, set protein called the N-set domain. And this was first defined in Bob Rader's lab that showed that there is an amino terminal portion to set one that was absolutely critical 
for activity and for the ability of this complex to be stimulated by monoubiquitinated H2B. So what's that helix doing? So this helix is not present in the APO enzyme, but it forms in this complex with the ubiquitinated nucleosome. And you'll see, I show these space uh, surface depictions over here of the compass protein of ubiquitin, the compass subunits, and we see the surface of the nucleosome. And you can see that that helix folds up here and just inserts in the middle in this gap that would otherwise be present between compass and the face of the nucleosome. But the conformational change that forms this helix is really dramatic. So we're looking on the left again, I'm going to show you a morph between the APO enzyme and this is a portion of that region of the structure shown over here. And you're going to see a really dramatic conformational change in compass that forms that RXR helix. And here we look here. So this strand straightens out over here, and this forms a new interaction surface that now nucleates formation of this helix, which is completely disordered in the absence of the nucleosome. So this helix contains a whole series of arginine residues that are conserved and that are critically important for activity. And this shows just a sample of experiments uh, Evan did in yeast, where he introduced single point substitutions in the arginine residues in the RXSR, RXR helix. And you can see all of these charge inversions or alanine substitutions really wipe out H3K4 methylation. So these arginine residues here, again, are contacting the acidic patch on the nucleosome. So here's the cluster of acidic side chains interacting with those arginine residues. So that's one important role of the RXR helix. And the other important role is contacting ubiquitin. So we're looking down at the face, of these clusters of arginines contacting the nucleosome, whereas this other portion of the helix that's nucleated contains a hydrophobic patch. And this cluster of hydrophobic residues is in turn interacting again with that same hydrophobic patch of ubiquitin that we saw was important for DOT1L interactions. But compass is interacting more with just that portion of ubiquitin. It's actually also contacting this other patch called isoleucine 44. And again, it's a conformational change, quite a dramatic one, in one of the other compass subunits, CPS50, that's responsible. And so look over here. We're starting with the structure of the APO enzyme, and I'll show you the conformational changes that occur here that rearrange these residues and now form a hydrophobic patch in this compass subunit that now is the interaction surface that interacts with isoleucine 44 of ubiquitin. And we'll turn that around just to see where it's contacting ubiquitin. So here is isoleucine 44 of ubiquitin. I'll circle that residue over there. And you can see all of the interacting residues here in CPS50 that forms the other part of that interaction interface. Okay, well, so we've seen dramatic conformational changes, uh, contacts with the DNA, multiple com contacts with the uh, ubiquitin. So what's the mechanism of, inter of activation by ubiquitination? Well, it's clear that that ubiquitin through its contacts with this RXR helix I've shown you here are important for helping to nucleate the complete ordering of the helix. And this helix in turn forms critical interactions with the surface of the nucleosome, in particular, the uh, acidic patch. But full disclosure, from work in Ning Zheng's lab, so Ning Zheng, determined recently the structure of the K. lactis compass complex. It's about 50% identical to the yeast complex. And they have a structure in the absence of ubiquitin. And what they found was that in fact, compass binds to pretty similarly to the face of the nucleosome. And that RXR helix is partly disordered, but not completely. So some of these residues contacting the nucleosome are still ordered. Um, it, clearly, the presence of ubiquitin is important for the ordering of that helix, but it seems to be a little more complicated than a simple on-off, that completely disorder to order. 
Okay, so uh, we're really getting to the end, so I, I will wrap up here, but I just wanna end by drawing some comparisons between the two structures that I showed you. So what are the common themes between what we saw for dot one l and the compass complex in the ways in which they recognize ubiquitin and are stimulated? Well, both of these complexes use arginines to bind to the nucleosome acidic patch. So in the case of dot one l it's just one arginine. In the case of compass, it's that entire RxR helix that's forming extensive interactions with the patch. Really, in both cases, the presence of ubiquitin clearly restricts uh, the conformational search, particularly in the case of DOT1L, where it limits the number of positions it can sample on the nucleosome. And so, by definition, that raises the uh, catalytic rate uh, and raises the activity of the methyl transferase on the nucleosome. In the case of COMPASS, it's, it's not really conformational search, at least based on the structure from Ning Zheng's lab, but more the conformational changes that ubiquitin favors in stabilizing the RxR helix. Ubiquitin also stabilizes the entire COMPASS conformation, so that whole flexing complex, clearly the, ubiqu the nucleosome bound form is favored by the presence of ubiquitin because of the multiple interactions it makes with compass. And finally, in the case of DOT1L, and this is where it's really quite different from compass, is the substrate-assisted catalysis, that the H4 tail needs to assist the enzyme in distorting the surface of the globular core of the nucleosome, and thereby inserts uh, lysine 79 from histone H3 into the enzyme active site. So I just want to end by thanking the people who did the work. Uh, really, a, two, two fantastic postdocs. Evan Warden did the bulk of the work for both of the structures that I showed you, and along with Nick Hoffman, who did the structure of the active state of DOT1L, and Chad Hicks, graduate student, and uh, worked on DOT1L, and Shangbin Zhang, longtime technician who was, uh, pivot, made pivotal contributions to both projects. Um, this is our happy group, which makes me feel very wistful because you see the lab in the background, which I haven't seen in over a month. This is sort of more the way we interact these days, but we're looking forward to getting back to work. Finally, these are the organizations that uh, supported this work with uh, money. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer questions. <laughs>